Welcome. In this video, we are looking at the CCMP version 8 uh, curriculum enterprise focusing on core networking. This is going to be the first of two uh, video series. Again, this is focusing on int core. Chapter 17, wireless signals and modulation. We are going to be focusing on basic wireless theory things like uh, understanding radio frequency signals and measuring as well as comparing them. Also we're going to be looking at carrying data over a wireless signal, basically providing an overview of the basic methods and standards that are involved in carrying data. So the first section, understanding basic wireless theory. We have to understand that wireless signals are traveling through the air as a, electro, uh, a electronic magnetic wave. And so things like its frequency is a fundamental property of the wave as it relates to data transfer. So we have to look at that. So in radio frequency communication, the sender or the transmitter will send an alternating current into a section of wire, the antenna which this sets up the moving electric and magnetic fields that propagate out and away from the antenna. So again, here we have the diagram. We see the electric field and the magnetic field, and we can see that they are not just a wave anymore. The electric and magnetic fields travel along together and are always at the right angle to each other. They're never going to be parallel. They're always going to be perpendicular. The signal must keep changing or alternating by cycling up and down to keep the electric and magnetic field cycling and pushing uh, outward. The electromagnetic wave do not travel strictly in a straight line. Instead, they travel by expanding in all directions away from the antenna. So the signal will grow as it gets further away from the antenna. In free space, the electric magnetic waves will expand outward in all three dimensions. So we again, even though it's a two-dimensional chart, we have to understand that the wave itself is going to be transmitted and grow in all directions. So let's try to get a little bit better understanding of that. So the waves reduced by an antenna will expand outward in a spherical shape. The waves will eventually reach the receiver in addition to many other locations. As we can see here we have a sender and this is omnial directional. The signal is going to go everywhere. After the receiver end of a wireless link it will process it and reverse it. As the electromagnetic wave reaches the receiving antenna they will induce a electrical signal. If anything uh, works right the receiver signal will be able to readily copy the original transmitted signal and be able to decode it. Here we have a basic understanding of frequency. The wave involved in a wireless link can be measured and described several ways. Frequency is going to be one of the big ones. Frequency is the measure between two points. A cycle is going to be an up and a down and back to an original state. An amplitude is going to be the height of one of the frequencies. So again, a, a cycle is beginning signal rise to the center line and fall through the center line and rise again at one the given point. We measure these cycles in hertz, H, Z. It's the most commonly used frequency unit and corresponds to the number of cycles per second. In the, the photo, we're looking at one second that has elapsed as shown and during that one second, there are four cycles. So we have four cycles per second, or four hertz. Since hertz is the base uh, measure of the unit of measurement, we have to understand that we have kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, and so forth. But everything is using that base hertz frequency and each time we increase it, we're increasing it by a thousand. So a uh, hertz to kilohertz is a thousand. Megahertz is another thousand times our kilohertz. For our gigahertz, it's a thousand times our megahertz. 
and so forth. So what happens when we look at our actual frequency spectrum? We can see that we have a very narrow window for our wireless technologies. Normally our radio frequencies are in the 10 kilohertz to 10 gigahertz range. And depending on what we are trying to accomplish, uh, AM ref uh, radio, FM radio, television, um, short range, uh, short wave radio, all of those have very specific frequencies. And within the microwave and radar range, we have two ra uh, frequency ranges that we can use for our wireless technology. 5 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. These are normally the ones that are selected because they are not licensed. They are free to use uh, frequencies. Most other frequencies are paid frequencies. So this kind of helps saves on the cost. You have to understand that our frequencies are all waves. Subsonic, what we can hear, our wireless, and then into radio or into waves that we don't see or hear things like cosmic rays or gamma rays and x-rays and ultraviolet light infra uh, infrared light as well as visible light light are waves as well so that's a basic understanding of understanding the frequency spectrum both audio sound and visual light as well as things that are not uh, viewable so since we're talking our two main frequencies 2.4 and 5 gigahertz addresses we need to understand what ranges we can actually work with with our 2.4 gigahertz it's not just 2.4 it's 2.400 through 2.4835 gigahertz this is normally what we refer to as our 2.4 gigahertz band even though it does not encompass the entire range between 2.4 and 2.5 gigahertz it's only a small portion well it's a portion of it if we're talking our 5 gigahertz that is actually 5.15 and 5.825 gigahertz these are the actual uh, bands that contain the following four separate distinct frequencies so the first section is 5.150 through 5.250 gigahertz that's our first band our next band is 5.250 through 5.350 gigahertz that's the second band you'll notice there is a gap between 5.35 and 5.470 so our third brand, uh, band is 5.470 through 5.325 gigahertz and then our last band is 5.725 through 5.825 gigahertz so there are some bands in this range that we don't actually get to use so most of the 5 gigahertz bands are continually except for the gap between again the second and third bands at this time of the writing, the gap exists and cannot be used for wireless technologies as it stands today. However, that doesn't mean that it won't change in the future. So we talked about bands. Well, with 2.4 gigahertz, we also have additional bands. Our bands are normally within like a 20-ish megahertz uh, group. And you'll notice here we actually have multiple channels. In the US, we can use between channels 1 and 11. Well, they don't show the overlap, but 1 overlaps with 2, 3, 4, and 5. 6 overlaps with 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10. 11 overlaps with 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14. So normally, when we're dealing with our bands, we are using these three channels 1 6 and 11 and again in the US we don't go past 11 but those are going to be bands 2.412 2.437 and 2.462 those are the main three bands that we will be able to use 
So as we're talking about our bandwidth, our bandwidth is actually going to be not just our central frequency, it's going to be the amount of data that that frequency can carry. So the actual frequency range needed to transmit the signal is known as the signal bandwidth. As the name implies, this refers to the width of the frequency space required within that band for sending that data. In wireless, the signal bandwidth is defined as the parts of the standard. Even though the signal might extend further, it doesn't matter. It's only going to be using that specific band. So anything outside the spectrum mask to be ignored will essentially be ignored. And they're going to be called out of bounds or bandwidth boundaries. So what we'll end up doing is and when I said earlier about channel 1 overlapping with channel 2, this is what it is talking about. Ideally, the signal bandwidth should be less than the channel width so that a different signal could be transmitted over every possible channel with no chance of the two signals overlapping. Channels 1, 6, and 11 are the only three that don't overlap with one another. So when the signal bandwidth is wider than the channel assignment, the signals overlap with each other, and this can be some uh, issues. They cannot coexist, so we actually need to separate out those frequency channels so that there is no overlap. The signal must be placed on more distant channels to prevent overlapping. Again, 1, 6, and 11. Here we have our phases. Our phase can either be in or out of phase. The RF signals are very dependent upon timing because they are always in motion. So the phase of the signal is a measure of shift in the time relative to the beginning portion of the cycle. If we shift our frequency, the start of it, we can actually get it out of phase. That will be the phase shift. So when we have two identical signals that are produced at exactly the same time, their cycles match up and they are said to be in phase with each other. If one signal is delayed, they're out of phase. Signals that are in phase tend to add together, where signals that are out of phase, that are at least 180 degrees out of phase, tend to cancel each other out. We don't want to cancel our signals out. That's one of the issues. So when we're manipulating our phases, we have to keep that in mind if the phase signal is going to be too far out of phase and may cancel the signal out as opposed to actually increasing the frequency speeds. So if we're looking at measuring our wavelength, again our wavelength is a measure of physical distance that a wave travels over a complete cycle. The wavelength is normally uh, designated by the Greek level lambda. So when we're looking at our frequency, the radio frequency waves that travel at a constant speed. This is the assumption in a vacuum. Radio waves will travel at the exact same speed of light. In air, the velocity is slightly less than the speed of light. So there is a, dist or there is a difference between vacuum versus in air transit. So the wavelength decreases as a f the frequency increases. So as the wave cycle gets smaller, they cover less distance. So it can cover less distance, but the frequency itself is increased. So that actually can allow for additional data to be sent, but it doesn't quite go as far. And we have another lecture coming up about that. So the fun part with this is now we can talk about our radio frequency power and our dB. So the strength of a wave can be measured as its amplitude the top to the bottom peaks. The strength of the RF signal is usually measured by its power in watts. So when the power is measured in watts or milliwatts, it's considered to be an absolute power measurement. Because absolute power values can fall anywhere within a huge range for a tiny decimal number to hundreds, thousands, or even larger, we use the log form for transform exponential ranges into a linear one. Basically, we're going to be using decibel as a handy function that will use our log form to compare one absolute measurement to another. 
It was originally developed to compare sound intensity levels, but it also applies directly to power levels as well. Decibels are always one of those funner ones because this is one of the more confusing sections when we're looking at our power levels. So we can look at the calculation for our decibel level, and this is where P1 and P2 are the absolute power levels of two sources. So our decibel would be 10 log 10, P2 minus log 10, P1. P2 would represent the source of interest, and P1 is usually called the reference value, or the source of comparison. The difference between the two log functions can be written as a single log of P2 divided by P1. So it would be decibel would be 10 log 10, P2 divided by P1. This ratio of the two absolute power values is computed first, then the results is converted into a log scale and basically allow the ratio of divisions from the equation is the most commonly used in wireless engineering world. Again, way outside the scope of what we need to know, but we have to understand our wireless signal measurements. So the important laws are followed. There's a the law of zero. And that is a value of 0 dB means the two absolute power values are equal. If the two power values are equal, the ratio inside the log is 1. Log 10 to 1 is 0. This law is intuitive. If two power levels are the same, one is uh, 0 greater than the other. We also have a law of 3s. And that is the value of 3 dB means the power value of interest is double the reference value. A value of minus 3 dB means the power value of interest is half the reference. When P is twice P1, the ratio is always 2. Therefore, log 10 uh, sub 10, 2 is always going to be 3 dB. When the ratio is half, so 10 log 10 half, it's always going to be negative 3 dB. So the laws of 3 is not very intuitive, but it's still easily learned whenever a power level doubles, it increases by 3 dB. Whenever it's cut in half, it's decreased by 3 dB. So again, if we are doubling it, it's going to increase by 3 decibel. If we are halving it, it's going to be decreased by 3 decibel. Okay, so our last law is the laws of 10. It's a value of 10 dB means the power value of interest is 10 times the reference value. A value of negative 10 times is basically the interest of 1 tenth the reference. So if we have our P2, 10 times P1, the ratio is always going to be 10. So therefore, 10 log 10 is going to be 10. Where if we're looking at P2 is 1 tenth of P1, then the ratio is 1 tenth, and 10 log 10, 1 10 is going to be negative 10. So the laws of 10 is also intuitive because multiplying or dividing by 10 adds up subtracts basically 10 decibels respectively. So what does that mean for us? When we're dealing with absolute power values, multiplying or subtracting or d dividing, the decibel values are positive and can be added. When the power varies are divided, the decibel values are negative and can be subtracted. So the product are going to be positive, division is going to be negative. So here we have a times 2. We're going to be increasing by 3 dB. If we are dividing it in half, we're going to be subtracting negative 3 dB. If we're timing it by 10, we're going to be adding 10 dB. If we're dividing it by 10, we're going to be subtracting 10 dB. And that is our basic understanding of our decibel power management. So now let's look at an example. We have source D and E. Both have a power level of 5 and 200 milliwatts. So try to figure out a way to go from 5 to 200 only using times 2 or times 10 operators. That's a little bit more complex. So if we're using the powers of 2 and the power of 10 operations, we can double 5 to 10, and then we can double 10 to 20, so we can multiply 10 to reach our 200 milliwatts. So here we have our source 
uh, e is equal to d times 2 times 2 times 10. That gets our 200 milliwatts. So we can use the dB laws to replace the doubling and the base 10 with the decibel equivalents. The results would be d plus 3 plus 3 plus our 10 dB or d plus 16 dB. That gives us our basic computation from our 5 milliwatt to our 200 milliwatts. So beyond comparing our two transmitting sources, a network engineer must be able to concede about the RF signal propagating from a transmit to a receiver. Here we're looking at the dB formula to compare the received signal strength to the transmitted si uh, signal strength. So what we can do there is the absolute power values at the transmitted and receiver levels can be converted to decibel. The results of which are shown below. And notice that our decibel measurement value can be added along with the path. So the transmit decibel measurement plus the net loss in decibel should equal the receiving signal strength. So here we have 20 decibel. We have a net loss of 65 decibel, so our receiving is going to be a negative 45 decibel. So if we're measuring power changes along our signal path, that means the transmit the, using its antenna and the cable that connects them are all distinct components that only propagate our wireless signal. Well this will affect our absolute power level. Our transmit power is usually a known value expressed in our milliwatts. So when an antenna is connected to a transmitter, it provides some amount of gain to the resulting RF signal. So the antenna's gain is measured by comparing its performance with that of a reference antenna, usually some form of iphotopic antenna, then computing a valued NDB. So an, an isotopic antenna doesn't actually exist because it's ideal in every way. The antenna will perform and can be calculated according to the RF formulas, making it a universal reference for any type of antenna. Again, it's ideal because it's perfect and ideal in every way. So some signal loss will occur due to the, to the physical qualities of the cable and the connector of the antenna. So cable vendors will supply a loss value in dB per foot or per meter so that you can calculate the loss based off of the cable. So the effect of isotopic radio power is actually the power level that will be radiated from the antenna. This value is calculated by a combination of the transmitting power, the loss from the length of cable, and the antenna gain. So the formula to calculate the EIRP is transmit power minus transmit cable plus transmit antenna. This is regulated by government agencies, again in most countries, and so there is a specific signal maximum or maximum allowance for our EIRP. So a link budget is the power levels across the entire path from our transmit to our receiver. Here we have our transmit of our 20 dB we have a negative 2 dB, we have a 4 dB gain, we have a 69 decibel loss, we have another antenna for uh, dB gain, and we have another 2 dB, uh, we have another 2 dB loss from the receiving cable, so our receiver should have a strength of negative 45 uh, decibel. We look at the transmit, we take into account the cable loss, the antenna gain, the loss over the signal, the gain for the next antenna, the receiving antenna, and we look at the loss for the cable for the receiving antenna. We do the calculation and we can compute our transmit power and our receive power. So what about our free space path loss? So whenever a radio frequency signal is transmitted from an antenna, the amplitude decreases as it travels through the free space. The longer the distance, the lower the amplitude. 
Even if there is no obstacles in the path between the transmit and receive, the signal strength will weaken. This is known as the free space path lost. So if the antenna is at a point where the RF data waves uh, travel in every direction from the antenna, the wave that's produced takes the form of a sphere. As energy is transmitted from the antenna, the sphere expands in the free space. Regardless of the antenna use, the amount of free space path loss through free space is pretty consistent. There are two main facts to factor in when we talk about free space path loss. They are that there is an exponential function where the signal strength falls off quickly near the transmit, but more slowly the further it uh, moves away. And second, the loss is a function of distance and frequency only. Have to have our calculus because that's where we're going to be getting into our functions. Uh, we're not doing worrying about the math component, but that's actually how that is calculated. So here we have our free space path loss is greater in the 5 gigahertz range than it is in our 2.4 gigahertz uh, range. In the equation, as the frequency increases, so does the loss of our decibel. So here we have an example of the range difference where both transmitters have an equal EIRP. The dashed circles show where the effective range is, ends. So 5 gigahertz will have a negative 67 dB, a lot faster than our 2.4 gigahertz range. So the path loss for our 5 gigahertz is quicker than our path loss for our 2.4 uh, gigahertz range. So the power levels at the receiver. So the receiver will usually measure the signal's power levels according to the received signal strength. That is using the RSSI scale, Received Signal Strength Indicator Scale. Basically the value is defined in the 802.11 standard as an internal one byte relative value ranging between 0 and 255, where 0 is the weakest and 255 is the strongest. So the range of our RSSI values can vary depending on one hardware manufacturer and another. Every receiver will have a sensitive level or a threshold that will divide the intangible useful signal from the intangible one. Again, some form of the wireless signal may not be tangible because it drops below a threshold that is acceptable. And that's going to be dependent on our vendors. So for our power levels at the receiver, we can focus on the expected signal alone without regards to any other signals that may also be received. So all other signals that are received on the same frequency as the one we're trying to receive basically is viewed as noise. So the noise will be uh, the noise level or the average signal strength of the noise is basically just called the noise floor. And that way that can be our lower level that we can ignore. A higher signal to noise ratio basically is preferred. A lower signal to noise ratio presents some problems. So let's move into how do we carry data over our radio frequency signals. So the main two takeaways from this section is understanding that modulation is a process by which the carrier signal is changed in order to carry data. And modulation schemes can alter frequency, phases, or amplitude, and the signal to indicate zeros and the ones from trans data or from data that's being transmitted. Our modulation, if we're talking modulation uh, frequency, we could be talking modulation of phase or amplitude modulation. These are just some of the common types of modulation that are going to be discussed, but they're not the only ones. So again, modulation is the ability to add data to the radio frequency signal, basically the, sig the, the frequency, the, the original signal of the original carrier must be preserved. Therefore, there must be some form of scheme for alternating some characteristics of the carrier signal to distinguish between a zero and a one binary. Alternating the carrier signal is known as modulation, where the carrier signal is modulated or changed according to some type of source. At the receiver end, the process is reversed. That way it can be decoded. 
So demodulation will interpret and add information based on the changes to the carrier signal. Common types of uh, RF modulation schemes generally have the following goals. First of all, to be reasonable immune to interference and noise. Second, practical to transmitting and receiving. If we are doing modulation one way, we have to ensure that we can decode it the same way. Due to the physical properties of a radio frequency signal, modulation schemes can alter only by the following types of attributes, frequency, phase, and amplitude, or combination. But only by varying the frequency, only by varying slightly above or below the actual carrier frequency. So minor phases for our frequency. However, we can have things such as all right, so the modulation technique does require some bandwidth centered on the carrier frequency due to the rate that the data is going to be carried, partially due to the overhead from the encoding, the data, and the manipulation of the carrier signal. Narrow bands uh, audio signals such as AM or FM radio have relatively low bit rates and little overhead. However, wireless LANs must carry data at a high bit rate requiring more bandwidth for modulation. Data being sent is spread out across several frequencies. This is known as the sped spread spectrum. Two common types of sped spectrum are the DSS and the OFDM. Both are used in our 2.4 gigahertz range. With DSS being used specifically in the 2.4 gigahertz range, where there's a small number of fixed wide channel support, with the OFDM, it is used both in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz range, where a single 20 megahertz channel contains data that is sent in parallel over multiple frequencies. Each channel is divided into many subcarriers called subchannels, and both phase and amplitude are modulated with quad ranging amplitude modulation CAM QAM Q -A -M, to move the most data efficiently. What's interesting here is when we're looking at being able to maintain uh, access point and client opera compatibility we have to understand kind of the rates that are supported, the channels that are supported, and the frequencies. The common ones, 802.11b, G, A, N, A, C, and A, X, are all there. You'll notice that things like 802.11g, it supports 2.4 gigahertz, where uh, N does both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Uh, A, C is predominantly 5 gigahertz. A, X is both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. However, AX is actually made to work from 1 gigahertz to 7 gigahertz, provided that the bands is approved for use. So AX is still uh, having some issues there. Data rates can be dependent based off of the technology. N is up to 150. AC is up to 180 or 100, mm, 866 megabits per second and AX should be closer to 1.2 gigs. But you'll notice the channel width support are all in the 20 megahertz range. Once we get past N, it's going to be 20 or 40. With the newer technologies, both AC and AX, they're all variations of 20, 40, 80, or 60. They keep doubling. These also provide the basic client compatibility because if you're dealing with a wireless card that does AC and you're connecting to a B network, there may be some issues, especially with older technologies, B and G, because they use different channel width. Wi-Fi standards will include things like the 802.1, sorry, the 802.11 in amendments that were published in 2009 for high throughput. AC amendment, which was introduced in 2013, and 802.11x amendment, this was known as Wi-Fi 6, and this was done uh, in the late teens of 2000, so I, I believe 2018 or 2019. 
2000, uh, sorry, 802.11ax also became an important area that has high density of wireless devices, so it actually has better airtime and throughput. It will use the OFDM access to schedule and control access to the wireless media with channel airtime allocated as a resource unit that can be multiple uh, devices simultaneous. Basically, the goal here is to uh, provide better allocation of the air time, but also being able to use that with multiple devices simultaneously, no longer tying up the access point single devices. So here we have an example of our MIMO. So our MIMO is multiple input, multiple output based systems. With 802.11n, wireless devices use a single transmitter and a single receiver. In other words, components formed a one radio resulting in a single radio chain. This was called a single in, single out based system. So one secret for 802.n ACAX is it heavily relies on MIMO. As we increased our different technologies in AC and AX, our MIMO technology has been increasing. So moving on, let's talk about our spatial multiplexing. So to increase data throughput, data can be multiplexed and distributed across two or more radio chains, all operating on the same channel, but separated through spatial diversity. This is known as spatial multiplexing. Here you're gonna start noticing with our MIMO, here we have a three transmit, three receive, so three times three MIMO. So the spatial multiplexing will require a good deal of digital signaling processing on both the transmit and receive ends. However, this does pay off by increasing the throughput over the channels. More spatial streams that are available, the more data that can be sent. Faster data transfer. When the sender and receiver have mismatched spatial stream support, however, they must negotiate a wireless connection and use the lowest number of spatial streams that they have in common. So transmit beamform. That's always a fun one. So in 802.11 AC and AX amendments offer a method to customize the transmitted signal to prefer one receiver over another. This allows Leveraging MIMO, the same signals can be transmitted over multiple antennas to reach specific client locations more effectively. With transmit beamform, TXBF, the phase of the signal is altered as it's fed into each transmitting antenna so that the resulting signal will arrive in phase at specific receivers. Here we have an example of different receivers being receiver A and receiver B and that allows us to use the TXBF to ensure that the signals converge properly when received by the receiving antenna. So we have a maximum ratio combining also. This is when a signal uh, is received on a device. It may be degraded or distorted due to whatever conditions there are. If there are the same signal as transmitted over multiple antennas, as in the case of MIMO devices, then the receiving device can attempt to restore the original state. Attempt to doesn't mean always is possible. So the receiving device can use multiple antennas and radio chains to receive multiple transmitted copies of the signal. One copy may be better than the other, and they can use this to combine them. This process is known as maximum ratio combining. It can combine the copies to produce one signal that represents the best version at any given time. Lastly, we have what's called our dynamic rate shifting. Here we have the dynamic rate shifting, DRS, and it operation at the 2.4 gigahertz range. As you actually move away from the receiver, Depending on the modulation and coding scheme, you can get the appropriate speeds. The further you move away, the slower it is. So each move for, of the receiver away from the transmitter in a larger concurrent circle causes dynamic shifts to reduce the data rate in an effort to maintain the data integrity to the outer reaches. A different modulation and code scheme is chosen.
And that is all we had for this chapter. We talked about a lot of different terms. And that is it. Thank you. If you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out. Again, with this material, being able to ask questions and discuss some of the topics in the lecture help build long-term retention, so do not be afraid to, to communicate with this topic. Again, I'm here if you need anything. Thank you.